Okay, so you see we have uh, this uh, expression, which is the differential cross section. Uh, let's check the dimensions first, physical dimension, and let's see whether everything is correct. Well, perhaps a little bit of simplification. Is else we have cleaned up. There is no problem in there. And perhaps some of the pies we can uh, clean up. There is 64 pi squared in here. There is a 2 pi, but there is a 4 pi squared down here. So it is 2 pi. Nicely, the pies are taken care of this way, and there is alpha, and there's also this pi, perhaps, okay, pi squared, right, one over pi in here. So what else? Yeah, the rest is uh, z over a zero to the fifth power. These are important powers, you know. <coughs> it is the power of quantum mechanics that you see that is one over the uh, Bohr, Bohr radius to the fifth power. So it's a very characteristic of the photoelectric, not the fourth or third or twenty-seventh, but one of the Bohr length to the fifth power. And h bar. Kf divided by m omega epsilon. Oh, by the way, there is an h bar squared down here. If I cancel the h bar squared coming up there, so I can write it as epsilon dotted into Kf squared times 1 over z squared over a0 squared plus q squared squared to the fourth power. So it is really in the ideal cleaned up form. So pi squares and everything cancelled. So this number is 32. So 32 times alpha is what we get really. Alpha is a characteristic quantum symbol. It shows that it's first order in alpha. That's nice. Because we have been carrying out of the first order perturbation theory, therefore the result should, it's natural that the result comes out to be proportional to the first. This is 32 can, after pi squares cancelled. Times alpha times u over a0 to the fifth power. Let's check the dimensions. Is it really the, does it have the dimension of length? It is cross section, so it should have the dimension of area that is the length squared. Is it so? Let's check. Let's work out in the natural unit system for dimensional checks only, but all these are, have to be put back to get the correct magnitudes. But now to check the dimensions, I go to the natural dimensions. So uh, there is a zero, which is one over a zero to the fifth power, L to the five. L is a scale. Now it has, does, has nothing to do with the size of the box or something. So there is 1 over m, which is length. There is 1 over the omega. Omega itself is 1 over the time. So it is time. Time has the same dimension as the length. Here, I'm counting. There is 1 kf and 2 kf, kf squared. Kf has the inverse dimension of length, right? Because k dot x is dimensionless. So k has the inverse dimension of L, L to the minus 1. It is cube. L to the minus 3. And what about the downstairs? In the downstairs, I have One over the length squared, right? One over the length squared, one over the length squared. So L to the minus two, L to the minus eight, L to the eight altogether comes out. Let's see whether we have done everything correctly now. Five, eight, and eight, 
squared. Indeed, this has the correct dimension of area, length squared. So it is a consistency check, obviously, that we haven't made a mistake at all. And quantumness is the first order alpha, etc., etc. So you can look at this expression in certain limits. For example, depending on the, you can plot it as a function of the momentum difference. If the momentum difference is large, that you can neglect this, so it becomes really these constants, kf times kf, so it, or it becomes kf cube, or if q is large enough that this constant is neglected, it is one over q to the is eighth power, etc. So this is um, uh, computed and it's measured in the laboratory with very good consistency. You see how complicated the expression is as compared to the original a proposal of Einstein, that simple paper, which it is due to that paper he has received the Nobel Prize. You know, it's paradoxical. It's the simplest of all his discoveries, but the idea was so great, they have granted him the Nobel Prize for that photoelectric effect. What is the idea? Due to the observation that the outcoming electron's energy is proportional to the frequency of the incoming light. So that it is the first step saying that energy and frequency are related. One is the particle-like property, the other is the wave-like property, and these two properties are proportional. So this entity, this strange entity called light, can show in certain circumstances wave-like behavior and other circumstances. Particle-like behavior, once he discovered that idea, eventually complemented by de Broglie's observation that it is not the light only, but also electrons, the matter particles also manifest the same behavior, that's the opening of the quantum theory. So it's so simple in mathematical, formalism-wise, but that's a great idea, so it brings, such ideas bring people Nobel Prizes. You can do such complicated things that there's nothing with the Nobel Prize, but beautifully powerful, no? It's so gratifying that we could come up with such uh, correct and complicated expressions using quantum theory at such a simple classroom level. So that finishes my discussion on the uh, time-dependent perturbation theory. So we are at a stage that I, I should either start the scattering theory so that non-relativistic and relativistic quantum mechanics are really totally separated out, or I can jump into the relativistic quantum mechanics and sort of keep ourselves disciplined so that at the end of the semester, two weeks, we can go back to the scattering theory. And I realized that in the past that's quite difficult to do. Once we move into the beauty of relativist quantum mechanics, we don't feel like going back to the non-relativist quantum mechanics. Well, as compared to relativistic quantum, ugly, isn't it? So what I'm going to do, I'll change my decision and I'll start with the scattering theory today. And so let's get it over with. This week and next week we can finish the scattering theory and we can then, with clean chest, we can turn our attention to that beautiful theory of relativist quantum mechanics with full speed. So it's scattering theory now. You know, this subject is an important subject in the qualifying exams. So if you don't cover this, you don't feel like asking questions on the scattering, that's bad. So in order to have the right of asking questions on scattering theory in the qualifying exam, I decided not to take any risk of skipping it. So let's get into scattering theory. <coughs> well, it's <coughs> quantum theory of scattering, obviously. And there are also some of you who's, who have taken classical mechanics at different stages in the, stages in the past have seen that. You can discuss it classically. What is the problem, really? Quantum theory of scattering, let me write the title. When you read the books, you, sometimes you will realize that the scattering and the collisions are used interchangeably. Some authors prefer to call it scattering, some people, some and other group of authors prefer to call it collision theory. Well, it is, first of all, let me qualify some of the basic ingredients in here that I will consider the time-independent formalism. Uh, 
I don't know whether any of you have already worked, seen any coverage of scattering theory. There's also a beautiful time-dependent formalism, starting with the initial beams formulated as wave packets. And of course, the time evolution of wave packets are quite complicated, but we are going to do the time-independent formalism. Once this is specified, then you realize that there is not much difference between, between this type of problem that we are going to address and the problems that we have been addressing till now. What were the problems we have been addressing till now? We have been looking at the stationary state perturbation theory for the bound state problems. Stationary state perturbation theory or stationary state eigenvalue problems, let's not even go to the approximation. Stationary state eigenvalue problems is solving the time independent Hamilton uh, Schrodinger equation or solving the energy eigenvalue equation. Bound states, energy is negative there. Scattering energy is positive. Once we do the time independent formalism of scattering theory, it is essentially solving the energy eigenvalue problem of a Hamiltonian describing the interaction of a system of particles, but here the energy is positive as compared to the negative for the bound state. Please pay attention to it. Rest is really the same, almost the same formulas. And what we are doing then is solving this energy eigenvalue problem for the positive energy case. It is then it's going to be scattering. If E is negative, then it's going to be bound state. Again, there is a, a say, two charged particles. In the first case, in the bound state case, they are bound together and you look at the energy spectrum here, they are not bound. You prepare them far away and there's a target in here, far away. Far away means we are, nowadays we are talking about very large scales, kilometers. What is the circumference of the LHC? 27 kilometers. So targets and the preparation stages are very far away, large scales. Then we prepare them to, a, to be in the plane wave form. That's well-defined momentum. Our projectiles are momentum against states and we shoot them. We accelerate them with low, high enough energy. We shoot them towards a target which contains some material, obviously. And then when the projectile, due to its very high speed, gets closer and closer to the charged, charged centers of this project, of this target, I'm describing Rutherford's atom, of Rutherford's experiment breaking away the clouds of the electron, get in the closer to the nucleus, which is a center of positive charge, then obviously there's an interaction between the incoming charged object. In order to speed it up, you need charged projectiles anyway. And then there's an interaction between them. That's essentially what we would like to discover, the nature of the interaction. Then it is affected Anyway, it's affected due to the interaction. It, the trajectory is bent and then the direction is changed. After a while, a few centimeters, we are talking about 10 to the minus 15 centimeters, therefore, after a few centimeters, it escapes the field of attraction or repulsion of the interaction region and then move away as a free object. And there are these huge detectors of 10 apartment building like Atlas and CMS and all those things. And they are detected, analyzed, their momentum and the energy are measured, as we will see. And then with the help of those final observations, then you, det you deduce, for example, what is the interaction in here? What are the internal structure of the target there? Etc. Etc. So the, in this sense, these scattering gadgets, machineries are microscopes, sort of microscopes of probing or looking, quote unquote, into the deep structures of the matter or the fundamental particles forming the matter, etc. 
So some people, some of my colleagues, don't like that terminology, the microscope or gigantic microscopes, but I noticed that the, former, the, the present director of the CERN, when he was giving that talk, he also used the terminology calling it gigantic microscopes. Of the high energy people, of course. Well, essentially, this is what phenomenology of or physics of the scattering is all about. Prepare a beam to be a well-defined state of momentum. Now I use a different normalization, Dirac delta normalization. Depending on the need, we have two recipes of normalization for the plane, free particles. One is the box normalization L to the minus three halves, which was more suitable for the bound state, confined, localized, and this one is not localized. It covers a huge distance, right, Kil kilometers, tens of kilometers. Therefore, imagining a large scale of box uh, with the sizes kilometers and then letting the L go to infinity is not psychologically that convenient. Mathematically, they are both okay, huh? So we use this direct delta type of normalization, so our inner beam usually is taking to be this well-defined momentum against state, a plane wave. And it comes, approaches, with speed it up due to some technical mechanisms, passes through, and then, well, some of them go through. Obviously, there are huge number of particles, depending on the luminosity, 10 to the 20s, 23, 25, 30s. Therefore, if it is one is sitting at rest in the lab frame, one is moving, of course, that's easy to visualize. But what is happening at LAC is that there's a beam of two beams colliding head to head. And there are so many uh, objects in each beam and then some of them miss each other, obviously. Some catch because they're, they're, there's the probability. Therefore, in this, if you look at it in this laboratory frame, some may go through unscanted, unaffected. Some also affected and they go move away in the form of, again, plain objects. But this time, if the potential here is spherically or centrally symmetric, they will go as plain fronted representation of the free particles. Both are free. Incoming is free. We represent it as plane wave. Outgoing is free. We are so, uh, to rep we are forced to represent it as spherically fronted waves. What is the other thing? We are going to uh, focus our attention on the elastic scattering. That's the ideal simplistic version, elastic scattering. Of course, most of the scattering is in the high laboratories or inelastic. But here, just to illustrate the picture that there are no pair creations or stuff like that, which pushes us into the <coughs> realm of quantum field theory, if you are going to stay in the context of quantum mechanics, we have to avoid creations of particle antiparticles, then it's elastic, is a good description, ideal, simple, that's, a, that's what I'm talking about. So if this is the case, what the initial energy is controlled by you, and you also for look at the regime only that final energy is the same as the initial energy. That's called the elastic. Energy is conserved. Energy conserving. Once we understand these uh, sort of physical issues, then we can start writing, constructing our formalism. Let me define now H0 is the free particle Hamiltonian, which is also at the interaction region, there is an additional potential, obviously. Far away in the past, that is further past, in the initial beam, obviously, it is this Hamiltonian, whose, again, functions are the plane waves, which we use plane fronted, but not to distinguish it with the, uh, whether it's plane fronted or spherical fronted, they are f f the eigenvectors uh, of the free Hamiltonian, so I represent that with the phi. 
And this one, again, vectors I will represent with this psi. Then, as it is in the time-independent formalism, the stationary state, then I, what the equations are, are the usual energy eigenvalue equations of the Hamiltonian. You say, why is this so? Of course, you should say, that's that. Well, I said it's elastic scattering. Energy is conserved. That's the particular regime I am looking at it. Fine, at the final end and the upper end, it's okay, but if there is an energy change in the interaction region, it's going to lead to the change, energy, change of energy in the asymptotic state feature. Therefore, obviously, in the elastic case, the energy eigenvalue of the full Hamiltonian and the free Hamiltonian are to be taken to be the same, elastic. How nice. It's unexpectedly simple, really, the way we are moving. So we have to solve these two equations simultaneously. Phi represents the free particle. Psi is the full scattering problem. This is the, the new psi we are going to find by substituting this, the full, as this full Hamiltonian, the A0 plus the V, that's going to give us a general solution containing the dynamics of the scattering. So how can we solve these two simultaneously? Well, let's write it in the nice form. That is H0 or E minus H0, that's much better. E minus H0, that's an operator. Move it, the, move, move this H0 to the right hand side and write it as such. That's an equation. An operator, number times identity minus H0 operator acting on phi is going to give you zero. And this one, if you write it in the same form by moving the H0 part to the right hand side, E minus H0, psi is equal to V psi. So the, my next business is to try to solve these two equations simultaneously. One is the homogeneous one. Right hand side is vanishing for the free particle case. For the scattering case, the full solution that is, the right hand side is not zero. So what is the general rule coming from the theory of algebra? The, the general solution of the full equation is going to be the general solution of the homogeneous equation plus the special solution of this one. How do you get that? By inverting that complicated. Complicated? Yes. Although it's not the most complicated operator we can think of against the one of the gradient squared. And that's in principle an infinite series expansion, obviously, because one over E minus a gradient square, right? So one over E minus H zero times V sine. Here is the equation that we find. Well, actually, I should have said you say equation, there are two equations, and combine them, you get another equation. Actually, it's an equation, although I, I'm, writing a, I'm writing a solution to these two equations simultaneously. It's an equation, because if this is the unknown, which I'm trying to determine, it appears in the right-hand side as well. So it's sort of an equation. What type of equation have that form? Integral equations, obviously, when I eventually I project that. On a basis, position eigenvector basis, you'll see that that's an integral equation. Indeed, an equation. Nice thing is that it contains both of them. But we are moving into dangerous, using Turkish version of English, we are moving into dangerous waters. <laughs> that's a wonderful English, isn't it? <laughs> Why? Because I have an operator, it's a strange operator, it's a singular operator. 1 over e minus h0, although you may say h0 is an operator, this is a number, although there is an identity, when h0 becomes identity at some level, it becomes infinite. We have to avoid that infinity. How do I do that? If you project this along from the left by on, on phi, as I, h0 gives you phi, any function of h0 satisfies similar eigenvalue equation. There is a danger that we can really hit a zero in the denominator, thus it becomes a singular operator. Out of sudden, out of these simple, simplistic arguments, 
We have really moved into a, a, a potentially dangerous region, so we have to find a way of regulating it. This is a fundamental uh, danger, so you cannot avoid to get rid of it altogether. Remember, we had the same problem in the plain way. You can regulate it. That is, you avoid that singularity so that you can carry out a healthy mathematical manipulation. That's the point. Well, these simple things are the things which make those great people great. Feynman and Schoenger. Uh, they said, if this Hermitian operator, that's a real thing. If you make this real thing uh, slightly complex, so that we don't have to always move along the real axis, we can avoid that zero. And then we can avoid the singularity. Because one over zero is the singularity. So those gentlemen, they said, let's do the following. Put a little epsilon. Eventually, at the end of the day, this small positive number epsilon is to be taken to zero in order not to affect the physics. If it affects the physics, of course, here is another fundamental constant. You have to go to the lab and determine it. We have plenty of fundamental constants. We are tired of them, so we don't want a new one. So this should be a mathematical tool, and you should be able to avoid this by letting it go to zero at the end of the day. Epsilon should take them to zero, but plus minus, we don't know. So that, for the time being, something left for the future physical discussions to determine. That's called the I epsilon prescription. When you hear I epsilon prescription, it's as, as simple as that. And you wonder why all the good things are so simple. At the end, of course, let me write it in the end. And you should be able that it moves, it moves out freely and safely. The pluses and minuses at the top is a reflection on which sign we should really take. So how do we proceed from this point on? We have to now, once the formalism is defined, we have to proceed towards physics. When I say physics, I mean the following. Let's, these are states, the abstract states in the Hilbert space, so I have to convert them into wave function language. Therefore, let me project this on the position eigenvector basis. So then this left hand side becomes. Notice that I have no time label. I'm doing time independent formalism, the stationary state formalism of the scattering theory. Obviously, you have to put in the time as e to the minus i over h bar et at the end of the day if you want time dependence to appear, obviously. So it is x phi plus x 1 over e p operator squared divided by 2m plus minus i epsilon. Well, perhaps I'll put it as a sub-index because operator and square aesthetically is not that nice. So it is uh, really uh, this times v and side plus minus. Well, I had the wave function of the scattering solution in the left, but I haven't been able to see the scattering solution on the right yet. How do I do that? I do it in the following manner. I have to uh, include that twice, but let's do it. Let me insert a complete completeness identity here as v cube x prime x prime and x prime. I will just play with the right hand side only instead of writing the entire thing. No, integral is just a C number integral. I take it out. X 1 over E P operator squared 
divided by 2m plus minus i epsilon. All the rest are numbers. E is the real eigenvalue of the free Hamilton, free and the interaction Hamiltonian because energy is conserved. They all have the same energy. And this is the i epsilon x prime x prime v x. Fine, it's moving in the right direction, but still you may say, still I don't see the wave function appearing. Well, if that is the case, then you insert another, ah, sorry, psi plus minus, of course. It is a Hilbert space vector in here, however, it's not the wave function yet, so you insert another completeness identity, which is d cube x prime, x prime, x double prime, I'm sorry, x prime is already used, x prime, that is also an identity you move in here. And what do you get? Let me write underneath immediately so that we can clean up the notation. Here what do you have is the following, d cube x prime, x single prime v, x double prime, x double prime psi plus ma. Fortunately, at the end of the day, due to these two steps, at the end of these two steps, I have been able, because I see the wave function in this formalism in the left, I was aiming to get the wave function here too. Indeed, in this form, it is an integral equation, obviously. But presently, it's a very complicated looking integral equation. We have to clean this up a little bit. Then I need a physical argument to clean this up. It may sound a bit, how do you say, unusual for some of you. Look at this expression. It's a bilocal expression, which is the, which is the matrix element of the potential operator, abstract potential operator, between well, in a continuous matrix representation of the potential operator, because it, these are continuous bases labeled, these are matrix elements, x prime and x double prime. Now we require locality of the potential, that the potential doesn't feel the two difference. It has to act on a single point. Therefore, I write this as V of x prime, delta cube of x prime, minus x double prime. That's a very strong physical requirement. Locality of the potential. Eventually, at the end of the day, when we go more into the discussions, you see that scattering theory is a, a very advanced, sophisticated formalism, obviously. At this level, you feel that locality is put in through this manner. V was the potential, and in that basis, it is the matrix element. The matrix element is diagonal in this continuous basis. Once you have this delta appearing, then you can carry out one of the integrations. Because notice that you have one integration over x single prime, and you have a second integration over x double prime. At least one of them goes away now. And then you get... the following. You get the following now. Psi plus minus x is x and phi. That's the free particle fun. I prefer to write it in this fashion. There is a single integral x prime x 1 over the e minus p operator squared divided by 2m plus minus i epsilon x. This is x, sorry. This is x prime. And then what? I have v of x prime here. Time plus minus x prime. That's it. I indeed have an integral equation. The unknown scattering solution, so-called scattering solution, psi plus minus of x is in the left and it's under the integral as well but it is multiplied by a huge complicated stuff.
That's the Green's functions times the V multiply and the integrand multiplying the psi in the right hand side. That's indeed an integral equation. And the solving the scattering problem means we have to solve this integral equation. And integral equations are usually solved iteratively. And you may say, why? Can't you solve it exactly? We cannot solve it exactly, obviously, symbolically. We are going to introduce a set of approximations called Born approximations. I'm sure at the modern physics level, at the 300 starting, you have seen what Born approximation is. But here is the formalism. Here is the formal background of why there, that there are such kind of uh, approximations you are facing. So let's, let's proceed. Obviously, we have to now determine that uh, quantity, which I will call the Green's function. The book calls it h bar squared over 2m for, I guess, obvious reason. So let me call, give that the same name myself. Call this, I have no different color, okay. Using the book's notation, I don't have to, 2m over h bar squared g. I give that name and then I will determine it. It is a nice thing and it's going, we are going to enjoy it while we are solving it. So obviously that thing can be solvable because that's a free particle Hamiltonian. It doesn't have any potential in it. The potential is to be multiplied afterwards to this one. Dynamics is carried in here. This is really kinematics. So we are going to determine the kinematics. How do we? Determine it. Let me move to the left hand side. So the G is a suggestive name, obviously. G is for the Green's function. So G is h bar squared over 2m times x, 1 over e minus p operator squared divided by 2m plus minus i epsilon. Put the plus minus in here. We have to keep track of this plus minus in the right way. So here plus minus, so this g carries the plus up and minus down. Eventually there, will get, there is going to be a switch, but let's wait till it happens. So you're going to see what it is. Okay. Well, P operator is on the axis. Let me remind you. Therefore, this operator is a very complicated operator. Let me remind you, 1 over E minus H bar squared over 2M delta x squared plus minus i epsilon times x prime. How do you define that? You define it by writing factor the e. You write it as 1 over e times 1 minus 1 minus h bar squared over 2m e delta x squared plus minus i another epsilon prime, but let's not worry about that. What is the meaning of this operator? It is 1 plus del squared plus del to the 4 plus del to the 6 plus del to the 27 all the way to infinity. That's an infinite operator. Then how you act them and convert them into that form and then how to integrate, resum, you don't know how to do it. This is always the case when you have gradient operator in the denominator and when you try to carry out operations, then these infinite series make it make life tough, sometimes make life impossible. So what we do is to use another trick of inserting the, this time the complete basis of the momentum operator. How do I do that? Here, dqp and dqp prime
you see? Well, then it's going to be beautifully clean because P operator on the P eigenvector acts like a multiplication operator. You see? So after inserting them, what do I have? H bar squared over 2m, double integral dqp, dqp prime, xp, and there is p prime x prime from here, and p 1 over e p operator squared divided by 2m plus minus i epsilon p prime. That's times. That's very nice. Now, p operator on p is p times p. And any arbitrary function of, OK. These are trivial statements, but I'm going to still write it. p op is p and p. That's the definition of the p, p eigen state, eigenvalue problem of the p operator. So you, through the use of Taylor's expansion, then I say f p operator. Any arbitrary function on p is f of p, p. OK, so th this is a very well-known statement. And this, is a big, this can be verified immediately by the use of Taylor series expansion. So if I do that, this p operator acting on here or there, it's Hermitian, gives you just p squared, not p operator anymore, p eigenvalue squared. So I take it out and write this g plus minus h bar squared over 2m <coughs> double integral dqp dqp prime times p p prime divided by e minus p squared over 2m plus minus i epsilon coming from here as this becomes a number, p squared, then I pull it out and write it as such. But I have to have those two wave functions to take care of. p is what? p is the momentum eigenvector in the Hilbert space. This is the wave function in the x spaces. So if I use the Dirac delta, it is e to the i over h bar x dot p divided by 2 pi h bar 3 has for the first factor, xp. And p prime x prime is the same for the prime indices, but conjugated. It looks quite complicated, I, I agree. But it's in the form that can be managed quite easily. Why do I say so? First of all, momentum, eigen, momentum operator eigenvectors are also orthonormal in the Dirac delta manner. I can carry out one of the integrations taken care of using the Dirac delta. So it becomes h bar squared over 2m dqp. And there is also, sorry, let me take out those 2 pi h bar, 2 pi h bar to the minus 3, 3 halves and 3 halves, 3. dqp e to the i over h bar p minus p prime, sorry. P x minus x prime divided by e minus p squared. These are all numbers now. That's the reason why I have no OP indices for the operator. P is this number over which I am integrating. That's a dummy integration variable, but E is the physical energy, which is the, the conserved energy of this elastic scattering process. So I will give it a name. I will write it uh, following my, my notation. 
I will call it um, K. This is the physical. It is controllable. I call it H squared K squared divided by 2M. So I define in terms of the physical conserved energy, introduce a variable Q, K, sorry. And for the P, this is the dummy integration variable. I define it H bar Q to get rid of the H bars. So this measure becomes H bar cube D cube Q. Okay, so G plus minus H bar squared over 2M, 2 pi H bar to the minus 3. And there is another minus 3 coming there. No, plus 3, sorry. H bar. Going to kill that. And so what else? E to the IQ X X prime divided by H bar squared over 2M. K squared is a physical. That's going to be a free thing in the left hand side. Minus Q squared. Plus minus I epsilon. You say why epsilon? Actually, it's funny, but let me write, let me write it as I guess for h bar squared. Well, actually, I should have written it in that form. Epsilon is a small positive number, which is to be left to zero. Call it h prime. Again, it is going to be. There's a sequence, a string of epsilons, all proportional to each other through the f multiplication of these positive real numbers. Epsilon. If epsilon is set to zero, epsilon prime is to be set to zero, right? Okay, good. I'll show you. Uh, I forgot. I forgot to put the DQ Q. Okay, it's an integral, obviously. Now, uh, just for the aesthetic of it, well, first of all, let me take that h bar squared over. Uh, that's, you see the def meaning of that addition in front, the definition of h bar squared. Over. It's cancelled, and I have 2 pi to the minus 3, d cube h bar is cancelled, that's the reason why 2 pi to the minus 3, d cube q, e to the, let me call this an n, call this difference x minus x prime, x is the, the left cat uh, bra and x prime is the right cat, so I define that difference instead of x minus x prime as y. So I Q Y divided by K squared minus Q squared plus minus I epsilon. Again, I resume the original notation instead of carrying it to I prime, epsilon prime, I call it epsilon. If you feel uncomfortable, we can put the epsilon prime. <coughs> Again, because I will further uh, move to another string. Here, uh, just for aesthetic ground, I have to write this as minus q squared minus k squared, now minus plus i epsilon prime. I would like to see the one over the q squared appearing. So if I take the minus out, 2 pi to the minus 3 d cube x. So, so this is g plus minus d cube q e to the i q dot y divided by q squared k squared minus plus. Please pay attention to the shift of the plus minus. At this level, it's plus minus on the left hand side, the label, which comes all the way from the lipman schwinger equation, now it's minus plus. If we get confused, we are in trouble. At this level, the sign minus plus, that's plus minus. Okay, so what we do next is try to solve this integral 
And I will do that after the break again. That's a good point. Stop.